Hi, my name is Amin Kinaben. Today I'm going to speak about the security evolution of gRPC inside the mesh, particularly inside Istio service mesh. I am a software engineer with focus on cloud native and free and open source software. Today I work at VMware in the standalone Tanzu Kubernetes grid, acting as a security and Windows tech lead. I have been contributing to the Kubernetes project since 2020 inside uh, SIG Network and SIG Windows sub projects mainly. My main interests are operating systems, computers, networks, and distributed systems. For the agenda, we start taking a look in the mesh and the zero trust security, how they fit together and what's the relationship between them. Next, we pass through the spiff and service identity problem inside distributed workloads. We look at the, and the spiff specification details and the spider implementation. Inside the EC side and service mesh, we take a look at the EC West traffic specifically and focus on gRPC, taking a look in the evolution of the protocol inside the project. Starting with the gRPC proxy less, we are going to deep dive and take a look uh, in how it works. And next, we are going to deep dive in the ambient mesh, Z-Tunnel, Waypoint, uh, and now the layer 4 and layer 7 capability, capabilities related to this. In the end, we finish with the conclusion and the wrap up for the end of this presentation. Starting with the introduction, what is the mesh? and how it relates with zero, security, zero trust security. Okay, Istio can provide security features that use well battle tested technology stacks. It can mitigate internal and external threats against our data, endpoints, communications, and the platform. The service mesh can give you ownership of authentication and authorization layer, decoupling everything from the development side and give you, giving you more flexibility for managing the entire ecosystem. The issue provides audit, protecting against non-repudiation attacks as well. Besides that, it has some strong gRPC capabilities, compliancy, compliant with zero trust security. But what is uh, zero trust security nowadays? So NIST has this specification called SP800207, where, where it says the zero trust model assumes that an attacker is present in the enterprise owned environment. So any workload independent of, of the environment is not trustable, unless proven. So we enforce the principle of least privilege for network and applications. The zero trust security is not a single architecture, but a set of guiding principles for workflow, system design, and operations that can be used to improve the security posture of any classification of sensitive level. Neither zero trust and the service mesh are silver bullets. Let's be very clear here. So when you talk about the zero trust security, we're not talking about uh, a final architecture or a final hard design for our system. But besides that, a few principles uh, that combine it can uh, bring you more uh, a more reliable architecture for our systems. So from these principles that are detailed in this document, uh, we have the fourth principle that's very interesting. It says access to resources is determined by dynamic policies and may include other behavioral and environment attributes. Meaning, we can define dynamic policies for your cluster or your system. Uh, that includes uh, behavior and, and attributes for the environment. How you define these, these attributes? They are defined by policies. And the policies have four traits. So, subject is the first trait. And it means the entity performing, it, it uh, indicates the entity performing the action. Second trait is the action. So the action being performed by the subject. Third is the target. The object, the action is being performed up. And the fourth is the condition. So 
for the policy to be applied, there is uh, a need for a condition to, to happen. Another interesting principle for uh, zero trust is the enterprise monitors and measure the integrity and security posture of all owned and associated assets. So at least you can provide telemetry and logging and audit by default for all the services in, inside the mesh. And that's how we are going to see more details, but that's the beginning of how issue and zero trust starts to make sense together and how the implementation of zero trust principles are the core build of issue. It's important to note that the zero trust principles exist as an auxiliary components as well. So you have other components that completes the entire, your entire architecture. They can be enterprise, public uh, key infrastructures, CM systems, threat intelligence feeds, network and system active log, logs, etc. Zero Trust uh, 101. So we understand a few of the principles that combine and create this, this, this design and architecture. Now we are going to see the components that make up uh, the concept of zero trust. First one is called a policy decision point or PDP. This is like the core or where all the policy determinations are installed. The second one is the policy enforcement point or PP. This is the edge uh, or data plane as we call inside, inside the issue. The PEP is, is responsible for enabling uh, monitoring and management at the communication between and the, co the connection and communication between the enterprise resource and the subject that uh, is accessing this data plane or the, or the services. So in this diagram, we can see clearly uh, the PDP or the policy decision point is defined by the control plane. So ECUD works as the PDP in this model where you have the policy engine and you have the policy administrations, the, the administration that allows you to create policies dynamically. At the same time, if you see the data plane, the data, the data plane or the proxy, the envoy sidecar in the traditional model works uh, as the PAP or the, the enforcement point where through XDS enable us to uh, apply the policies from the PDP side. So now we need a way to identify our, our, our workloads inside this environment. Um, the workload needs uh, a specific identifier for us to trust and create our policies up and on. And the SPIF protocol implementation was created exactly to provide us a common way to do that. The SPIDI, as we are going to see, is the implementation of the SPIFI protocol. So SPIFI stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. And this is a set of open source standards for securely identifying software systems in a dynamic and heterogeneous environment. The SPIFI ID is the way you identify your workloads. It starts with a trust domain and has a workload identifier inside of it. The workload identifier on these two and Kubernetes can be the service account of your uh, workload. The other important uh, trait here is the SV or the SPIFI verifiable identity document. It supports uh, two methods of uh, communications. The first one is X509SV and is, it uses certificates for East-West traffic. The second one is the JOT SV and it's used for north-south uh, traffic communication. The good news is that Envoy uh, and Issue uh, has uh, an implementation of the SPIFI uh, and Spire inside of themselves and you can use them uh, transparently for MTLS communication across your workloads. So talking about uh, the Spire implementation. So the Spire implementation implements the SPIFI API and performs both node and workloads attestation. And this is a critical part of the entire protocol. 
it is issues uh, as feed to the workloads after uh, they are test tested inside your uh, Spire program. The cool part is that the server and the agent uh, are very dynamic and they have plugins where you can, can extend and add your own logic to validate uh, this kind of attestations. The way it works that the first, the node start attestating itself and it requires that the agent authenticate and verifies itself when connecting uh, to the server. In our case, the Spire server API. So your node will have workloads inside of it and as the second phase, the workloads need to attest themselves as well. So you can use a few methods of the, of the attestation for workloads, but basically it answers who is the process that's being uh, authenticating and identifying identify itself inside uh, your zero trust domain. In this example here, uh, we have an envoy, an OPA policy uh, usage. This is like a practical example inside the Spiffy website. You can find all the code to run them. Here we are going to analyze the diagram and understand better uh, how this is implemented. So in the example here, we have two front ends, one on each side, and in the end, you have another server called backend. If you see the communication between the front end and the backend, uh, uses MTLS, meaning mutual uh, TLS authentication between both sides when this connection happened. So as you can see, the Envoy proxy has a big part of this. And here we can have a hint on how it started to uh, create these MTLS authentications inside the service mesh. So Envoy allows you uh, to connect to another Envoy and uh, have this communication through MTLS. Still, you need uh, your spy agent running on uh, each one of the nodes. And this will use SDS to extract uh, the Envoy. Uh, to extract the certificate and the CA uh, certificates for, for the envoy. So uh, the, the agent has this proxy uh, proxy uh, authenticated that communicates and brings the certification, certificates uh, to envoy and transparently can communicate uh, and authenticate across your double quotes mesh environment. In the end, we can see this example here or of, of an authorization. So after you have this authentication through MTLS, you can auto authorize your workload to access or not. So basically, you, in this example, you can use open and you can use a, a description language to validate this, this information. So the default will be everything is false uh, in the allow path. And you can say everything that comes as a method post and it's coming from this spiffy ID in this case, cluster local as a trust domain and the namespace default with uh, the default service account grpca is allowed to authenticate. So let's talk about uh, the issue service mesh and the grpc connection in the issue west overview and how this uh, can fit the zero trust secret model uh, as we saw in the beginning. Uh, and uh, let's take a look in the history uh, of gRPC treated inside the project. So gRPC proxy was the first idea of removing this envoy as the sidecar uh, in your application. So gRPC library can connect directly to ESTUD via XDS library so your application has the capability uh, to connect without uh, any interface to ECUD directly. It still needs a bootstrap file uh, with some settings. So to inform how your application will connect to ECUD. Uh, and you still have the sidecar uh, of ECU agent, but you don't have any proxy uh, related to that. 
So as you can see in the picture, the East UN agent provides you the certificate and the GRPC XDS bootstrap for control plane connection. The cool part of this is the footprint of resources used is super low because all the logic uh, resides on, on your application and you don't have any uh, external path uh, through out to get all this information that you need to bootstrap your application. So the second way, and we are going to see a demo uh, as follow, is the Istio Ambient Mesh. So Istio Ambient Mesh was another idea uh, from the Istio team to remove the sidecar uh, totally. So the Ambient Mesh is, is split in two components, basically. First is the layer four component, uh, and the second is the layer seven component. So the la layer sev seven is still uh, an envoy proxy, what they call the waypoint proxy, but it's not required in terms of zero trust and MTL, uh, MTLS connection. All the connections happen at the Z-Tunnel level. This is a Rust uh, project that was created exactly to uh, provide only this capability of overlay and uh, encryption between the nodes and workloads. So as you can see, the ECD still works as a PDP and in this model, the Z-Tunnel uh, or the way uh, points are your PAP. The Z-Tunnel is a demo set and the waypoint is a uh, deployment and don't, don't necessarily run inside of each one of the nodes uh, of our cluster. In the example here of the diagram, just to illustrate, we have another demo set called Istio CNI that set up the IP tables rules and enforce all your workloads traffic throughout the Z tunnel. So Z tunnel detects if the work the other workload that uh, is inside the mesh has or not the waypoint and forward the traffic to waypoint if it exists. And the waypoint can be created by service account or for your entire namespace. Decreasing uh, the amount of uh, overhead that the sidecar uh, had in the traditional model. So after the waypoint uh, receives the traffic from gRPCA, it forwards the traffic uh, to the Z-Tunnel on the node workload and Z-Tunnel through the IP table rules can find uh, the correct workload routing. Uh, to illustrate this aut authentication and authorization on issue and how these dynamic policies work, in the left side we have the authentication. So the authentication is pretty simple. It means you have or not uh, your MTLS enabled for all the workloads. So if you have this, the Spire implementation of, of Istio and Zitano will take care of uh, the authentication and certificate generations uh, for your workload communications. The more interest, interesting uh, part here, as we're going to see in the demo, is the authorization policy uh, that can be created as a CRD in your Istio uh, service mesh. So the first thing we can see here is the selector for this authorization policy or the target. So you can set this to be applied uh, on a specific workload. In our case, we are saying, okay, install inside the waypoint, uh, in all the waypoints inside your cluster. Next, you have the action. It can be deny or allow. In our case, is is allowing uh, this specific authorization policy or, or uh, the conditions, if the conditions match, it will allow you to uh, execute that. Second, you have the subject and you have your from field saying, okay, this is the subject that uh, created uh, this, this policy or uh, is applying the policy, right? So it will filter for this particular gRPCA saying all the workload, all, all the traffic that's coming from this spiffy ID in particular can be accepted. And final, we have the condition. So for this condition to have to happen, we have the operation and we have paths. The operation on gRPC is only post. 
So gRPC has HTTP uh, 2 and it uses POST as a default method of uh, operation. And we can filter by paths, uh, both by service and, and methods inside your uh, gRPC. As we, as we saw in, in the example, the dumb server stream uh, is the method we are filtering out. Let's watch the demo locally and we're going to install Istio uh, service mesh Istio and then um, the first thing we, we are going to do is run Istio CTO install with the ambient uh, variables in the settings now uh, the customize is being used to install the gateway API CRD that's required for running uh, Istio ambient and the waypoint component. Uh, besides that, it's being installed a few uh, other components like Yali and Grafana. And the default name space will have the ECUIO data plane mode equals ambient, meaning all the workload that's running in, in this namespace are going to be in the mesh. So now we can use K9S to take a look in the workload that's running and at the same time we are going to deploy our application uh, behind the scenes. The spec are like two gRPC uh, workloads, a client and a server uh, as we are going to see in the following uh, sections. If we take a look in this spec here we have the spec apps and the deploy. We have a service account, a service on 9000 and a deployment object uh, with a specific gRPC bin uh, pointed to the latest in the image here. Go into one of them, show it in one of them and do a gRPC curl uh, for the gRPC B service. So we, we join uh, the gRPC A service and curl gRPC B service. If we get uh, the, the Bing gRPC curl SH, we can see we are sending a payload to the service on 9000, on port 9000, in the service gRPC Bing, gRPC Bing, and the method is dummy server stream. Some of the policies that we are going to create to uh, create some authorizations in, in the server. The first uh, authorization policy that we have, we will apply to the uh, Istio waypoint with this label here. And we are seeing allow everything that comes from the gRPCA uh, SPIF ID pointing to the service account in the default namespace with this path. So we have the path of the dumb server stream method and we have some server reflection that's being used by the, by the waypoint as well. And this will apply the policy, so we can go into we can go into the gRPC B and try to gRPC curl the gRPC A in the opposite direction, and this will tell us that this is a uh, access denied or back invalid because we have only an authorization policy going to the gRPC A to the gRPC B and not the opposite. So if you want to do this, we need to create another uh, authorization policy. So if you go to the gRPCA uh, and try to do the request to the gRPCB, this will work as expected, right? This authorization, this authorization policy here and say, okay, now my method is not dummy string, the uh, server string anymore. Uh, is like the real server stream and this dummy server stream uh, doesn't exist is not allowed anymore and if i block this like let's say this is a production server or method that was created so the one that's running is not blocked automatically but uh, but when you try to run again it say okay access denied you cannot access this anymore because this method does not exist so you can come back here and say oh I can roll back my uh, authorization policy to allow this request and I say, okay, dummy server stream. I change this authorization policy and I try to curl this again and everything is working back. So let's wrap up and have a conclusion of uh, this presentation.
A few interesting uh, tests that I have been conducting on a local cluster, so don't take it seriously. Uh, it's only to measure a few informations that, that uh, can be compared. So the first one is a traditional sidecar. So as you can see, we have 5,000 uh, connections uh, and we have a thousand connections per second for all the tests. And it took like uh, almost uh, one millisecond or two milliseconds uh, and the average of uh, 0 0.88 milliseconds. What is not bad. The second example is using uh, L4 Z tunnel. So the L4 Z tunnel uh, has, a, has a better outcome. It has uh, 300 uh, microseconds for most of the connections and um, the average of uh, 180 uh, microseconds of response. And the winner is the gRPC Proxilus uh, with the average of uh, 108 microseconds as well, but uh, most uh, of the requests came to uh, 300 microseconds. Uh, so uh, the example of the project was is used was the issue testing app, and the load uh, the load testing project is the GHZ. You can replicate this kind of tests. Uh, it's pretty simple and uh, it's advised for you to do this in a, your real workload and real cluster before running these things in production. All right, so what's the right choice for me or uh, how I can pick one of them? So the Proxly, the Proxless uh, gRPC with issue is still reduced in functionalities. It, uh, has a reduced uh, resource consumption as we saw in, in the examples, but it still uh, needs more integration and implementation in the, their roadmap, but is the, the coupled from the control plan and coupled uh, for, for our code. So if you don't plan to run uh, your gRPC services outside, uh, inside the mesh, uh, full inside the mesh, but want to test, a few uh, a few things you can implement everything inside your code for the ambient mesh it provides a solution without the sidecar it has authorization policy uh, it has uh, more complex features if you use the waypoint it adds a few of the latents when you add uh, the envoy but still gives you the entire uh, service mesh uh, enablement it can integrate with the sidecar uh, service mesh, and this is a fully uh, development and, and uh, going to beta in the roadmap soon. It, uh, it, it is decoupled from the code and has the same principles of, uh, of Istio uh, in the idea, but it's still coupled with the data, the data plane. All right, so shout out to Flan that helped uh, creating the content. Uh, and thanks, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach me out. Thanks and see you next.